Well, it is good to be with you. My name is Robert, and I am the pastor here at Fellowship. Probably should have introduced myself a little earlier if you didn't know. Um, But we're going to be in Mark chapter 10. And right now we are going through the gospel of Mark, and we've been going through this. And if you're just catching up with us, that's great. Uh, It's one of those things. You can just kind of catch up where we're at. Uh, We also keep all our messages online as well. And so we're going to be in Mark chapter 10. These black Bibles are all around you. Uh, And this is your Bible to keep. So if you don't have a Bible, take this one. Uh, If you know someone who could use a Bible, take this and give this uh, to them as a gift. We're in Mark chapter 10, starting in verse 1. And before I get into the actual text, I want to give like kind of one of those warnings. All right? So I don't pick the topics. The Bible and where we're at picks the topics. And sometimes it aligns really great in my mind. Like, God, that is a topic for today. And sometimes it aligns really poorly in my mind. And I'm like, God, why that topic? I think they're working on our technical difficulties. That was like perfect, though, you know, the timing. Perfect. But I wonder why this one today, because the topic we're talking about is one that I know has impacted so many of you. And what I don't want you to feel out of this is a sense of judgment or persecution. But what I want you to understand and know is God's love, his mercy, and his great plan for you. And the Satan wants us to take a topic, like I'm going to announce, and going to want us to look backwards and see what our life was. But God wants us to look forward and see what our life can be. And so I don't want you to be hearing this topic from a standpoint of, oh, the pastor's up there banging the pulpit, fire and brimstone are coming from heaven, and I'm just like, kind of watch out, where's the asteroid from? I want you to hear it with God's love, his grace, his mercy, and his goodness. And I don't think that's taking the scripture out of context, because when you see how Jesus handles it, he did it the same way. The topic we're going to talk about is the topic of divorce. And this is a topic that affects so many people. As many of you know, I have the privilege of being the chaplain in our police department here in the city. And what I have found is that divorce rate might be in the north of 90 percentile when I meet with them because their job is so demanding and so hard on marriages. Across America, the divorce rate is over 50%, and I wish I could say in Christian homes it's a lot stronger, but the reality is oftentimes it's not. And I believe it's because the church doesn't spend enough time talking about the tough subjects in a way that allows people to come to church with their brokenness and not with their perfection. Because so often what I have found time and time again is we walk into church and we make sure we're all buttoned up. I mean, my kids, I make sure they have nicer clothes on like it's often a nicer pair of shorts or a nicer t-shirt because that's about where I can get but a little upgrade when you come into church right and then we feel like our whole personal life has to be a little upgraded but the reality is life is full of peaks and it's full of valleys and there's times that we walk into church and everything isn't what it was at one point and so as a church I hope we're that place where we can be a place that can love people through the challenges and that's why we're going to talk about this There's a poem I came across, and it's called The Monster. It says this, the monster's here, the monster's there, the monster is just everywhere. In my milk, in my tea, doesn't it ever think of me? Mom's here, dad's there, and I'm just not anywhere. How can I say this without any force? The monster is called divorce. That poem hits you with where a kid can be in this struggle. I'm here and I'm there. Mom's here and dad's there. The struggle of this monster in their life that they're battling through. And I have seen the ugly face of divorce. Now, I have not experienced that myself. And so I can't come at it from an expert perspective in that regard. But what I can say is I've seen the struggles that people have had to face because of it. I've seen the effects and the ramifications of it. The heartache, the brokenness, and the despair, they are real. And they are things that both the family in multifacets is going through. As John Piper put it, 
death, something I have experienced quite often, that death is usually a clean pain. Divorce is usually a dirty pain. And the reason is because in death, we have to just deal with the separation. In divorce, we're dealing not only with the separation, but it being in our face every single day. And that makes things really, really messy. I was walking alongside a brother in, the cr- in Christ who went through a, a pretty bad divorce recently. And, you know, trying to love the Lord and, and serve the Lord and be living for the Lord. But unfortunately, his wife kind of got caught up in different things and went a different direction and, and kind of just left him and the family not realizing, you know, what was going on. And he shared with me about his boys and the struggle that they were having with it. And what hit me so deep is when he said, every morning, my one son wakes up with his face in the cereal bowl because he just can't find the motivation to face the day. That is a hard pain and a hard agony and a hard thing to have to face. But while I have seen that part of it, I have also seen the way God has redeemed marriages, has redeemed relationships, and has redeemed families in a way that only God can. I've seen him take the ashes and rise out a phoenix of relationship. Couples who have found hope, families that have had their heartaches healed, and faith beginning to strengthen in a household. While the text addresses a topic that's impacted so many, I want to keep three things in mind. The first thing I want to keep in mind is this is a complicated topic. And the Bible actually has various things to say about it. When we read scripture, it's not like, oh, where's the topic of divorce? Let me read a line. Context is so critically important to our understanding. We have to know the whole passage, the whole summary, what is going on completely. And there's no way that we're going to be avoiding this topic. While I can't cover every nuance of divorce, because that is often a question that I get asked as a pastor, what about this situation and what about that situation? That is a place that I am happy to come alongside you, but we're not going to address every specific issue. We are going to talk about divorce, though, and God's heart behind it, because the easy thing would be to skip the topic completely. But as a church, we believe that it is important that we preach the whole counsel of God, which means we go through the books of the Bible and we see what God has to say. And when you do this, you don't get to avoid tough subjects. And the third thing, and I think this is the most important We cannot afford to let our emotions overcome Scripture. It's very easy for us to say, I feel this, I've experienced this, I've gone through this. Pastor, you don't know my life story. You don't know what I feel in it. That emotion cannot become our conclusion of what the Scripture says. Because it's then that we begin to see it from a clouded, jaded view and not from a truthful vantage point. While I have not gone through this, as I said, I know many of you have, and I believe Jesus' words in our text are not there to shame us of our past, but to strengthen us about our future and what God has in store for you. So let's dig in. Is that a good preview? Is that a good summary? You with me? All right. So we're in chapter 10, verse 1. And it says, Then Jesus left Capernaum, If we remember last week, he was there and went down to the region of Judea into the area east of the Jordan River. Once again, crowds gathered around him, and as usual, guess what he was doing? He was teaching them. It doesn't talk about exact topics of what he's teaching, but we see that Jesus is teaching them. And we see the crowds are gathered, which is something that is typical in Mark. But something that I know when I've read through the Bible before, I've just kind of skipped over all the cities and the towns. But we're not going to do that because, once again, context is very important. And where he is is very important. 
we know a couple things because the larger context is so important and for us to understand is one, Jesus is teaching. He is teaching things. Many things, I'm sure. He's teaching the crowds along with his disciples. We don't know what Jesus is teaching about, but I'm sure it's something to do with the kingdom of God. Just looking through what we know of Jesus, he's probably teaching about the kingdom of God in some way. And Jesus is portrayed as an authoritative teacher. So it's not like he's just teaching and he's like, oh, well, here's some like kind of nobody. He has some authority to his teaching and they know that. Many are here wanting to learn from him. We know this because of the crowd's presence. But the area is also important. Jesus is teaching in the area east of the Jordan River. This is the region where Herod Antipas ruled. Now, who is he? He's the one who executed John the Baptist. This is his region. This is where his leadership is. And why I say that is because this is back in a Jewish area where the religious leaders are very present in the life of the people. The Pharisees are present in their life. They have authority. And it's almost as if Jesus is teaching with this authority, but they have this authority. And you're going to see those two battling with one another. And what we'll see is the religious leaders come to trip him up with a question. Context is so important. Because the way Jesus answers this question and understanding why they're asking this question is what's important to us. Because the author did not leave all the things Jesus taught about, because there were probably many, but he talked about this specific topic. So he's teaching them, and in verse 2 it says, Some Pharisees came, and it's so clear, and tried to trap him with this question. It's like, clearly this was a trap. Clearly this is something that they were causing him to stumble with. And what is the question that they're trying to trap him with? Should a man be allowed to divorce his wife? I feel like we ask the question that way. Pastor, should I be allowed to divorce my spouse? It's almost like a black and white, right? And they're asking this question as if it's a black and and why question but the key is that they're coming with the idea to to trap him or to trip him up if we're to look at the original language of it it's actually the word for tempt or to test in a way to make one sin the same word is used when jesus is in the wilderness with satan the same exact word is used where it says that he was tempted tested tried tried to be tripped up by Satan for 40 days. Do you see a commonality here? Here the Pharisees are acting no different than Satan himself. And who is Satan? The deceiver. The one who wants to trip him up. The one who wants to cause him to sin or to stumble. They wanted to get Jesus with the I got you question. See, now Jesus, I got you. Now you don't know how to answer it. And the other thing we know is that these Pharisees had already began plotting to kill Jesus back in Mark chapter 3. And they did it with these people, the Herodians, which is in this region. It says in Mark 3, 6, at once the Pharisees went away and met with the supporters of Herod to plot how to kill Jesus. Jesus. Jesus is in enemy territory where they want to kill him and they are looking for every way that they possibly can. And so they come to him with this question, Jesus, is it okay for a man to divorce his wife? And they're sitting there like, yes, yes, we got him. This is the question. This is the one that we're going to get Jesus to trip on. This is the one that we're going to cause to arrest him. And if we know the context of all of it, Jesus had told his disciples, we're heading to Jerusalem, basically. I'm going to the the cross this is going to happen and as he's starting his journey the question is is it going to happen now is it going to begin now because now they have him cornered but jesus teaches us so many things about life i think so many things with how to handle sticky situation tricky situations 
Because it says in verse 3, Jesus answered them with a question. Questions are often more powerful than statements. When we are in sticky or bad situations, how often do we want to give a statement? Oh, you're wrong, or let me give an absolute. Sometimes it's wise to just ask a question and not have just an exclamation point or a period. Maybe some of you are like wondering, how do I handle conflict in my home? Can you give me some practical relationship advice? Just ask a question. I'm being quiet because I promised my wife that I wouldn't bring us into this. And I literally told her in the VIP meeting, you are not in my notes. She's a saint, I'm a sinner. Just remember that. So Jesus answered them with a question, what did Moses say in the law about divorce? Here's the question. Let me put it back in your hands. What did Moses say about it? He doesn't give the answer. He clearly knew, right? But he's like, here's a question for you. How would you answer it? We see Jesus asked lots of questions during his interactions. And while there's vast amounts of statements that I'm sure Jesus said, often the Bible just says he was teaching. The questions are the ones that get written down. The questions are the ones that get remembered. The questions are the ones that cause people to have to think. And here we see him ask this question. And he's asking this question because he's going to reveal the heart of the antagonist, that person who is against him. Because in answering this question, he was going to learn which camp are they in. You see, there were two schools of teaching on divorce. These were rabbinic teachings. These are things that we have well recorded in Jewish history and understanding. The first one came from Rabbi Shammai, and this is your conservative school. This is the one that took more of a hard stance on things. And Rabbi Shammai would teach that the only grounds for divorce was adultery. You stay together unless there's adultery. You also had Rabbi Halal. This is the more liberal school. And this was divorce could be granted for any sort of indecency. And so you have two schools of thinking, two things that are being taught to the Jewish people, and Jesus wants to know which school are they in. So they answer, and they answer with four words. Verse 4, well, he permitted it. Moses permitted it, Jesus. He said a man can give his wife a written notice of divorce and send her away. Sounds kind of cut and dry, right? You don't like your wife? There you go. Peace out. That's what it sounds like to me. That's what they're saying. Jesus, it's pretty simple, actually. Moses made it quite convenient for us, in fact. The Pharisees point blank say that Moses permitted divorce. They even go further to say that a wife with a written notice could just be sent away. And it begs the question, but what about the woman? Like, that seems horrible. I'm just going to be honest. Because we know that this is a hyper-patriarchal society, and I think one of the bashes that we get on Christians today is that we're some hyper-patriarchal people as well. Uh, as we're going to see, God's design is for man and woman to complement one another, not to dominate one another. That's not for the man to dominate the wife, nor for the wife to dominate the husband, because I've seen both but to complement one another. And it's in that complementary relationship that God has his design for us. But I think of the woman because I think of Exodus 21, which is one of the teachings on divorce, and it's in Exodus 21 that it says, if a man who has married a slave wife takes another wife, he must not neglect the rights of the first wife to food, clothing, and sexual intimacy. Go read this to your children. <laughs> If he fails in any of these three obligations, she may leave as a free woman without making any payment. Whew, I'm not going to unpack that. <laughs> but this is emphasizing the importance of a man not to neglect a woman. 
to not neglect taking care of her. And then guess what they did? They debated, well, what does it look like to take care of her? What is the proper amount of money and food and clothing and things that I could? How many times should we have sexual intimacy? And they debated these things. Like, and they tried to make laws upon laws upon laws so that they could follow some rule book so that they could understand, like, just like we do as Christians often, how, what's the line that I can get to without crossing? And so they just kind of did that. But if these needs were met, or if these needs weren't met, we know that a woman could then ask for the divorce herself. In fact, uh, believe it or not, we have archaeological evidence of this. Papyri X have, for all those who care, SC 13. That's how we label the papyri. So papyri are, are fragments or parts of uh, things that we have found in antiquity, so kind of more things that are ancient or dated. And there's one that we found in the Judean desert, I didn't find it. I say we as if like we, I mean us as humans found it. Um, and it was actually a letter of divorce from a woman to the man. So we see that this actually did take place. And it was widely understood and accepted that the topic of divorce was highly debated and differing conclusions were made, just like it is today. I see this in churches all the time. Well, what, what, one of the things we had a debate as a church, right, just live, living out a real example, is uh, what our policy was on elders who have been divorced. Because there's some churches that would say, absolutely not. If you've had a divorce in your life, you are not qualified to be an elder. As a church here, fellowship, we stand on the lines of a husband of one wife. So you're not living in a polygamous relationship. You're not living with many wives, but you have one wife that you're committed to, that you're loving, and, and we'll kind of see what the grounds for divorce was. It's not like you have a track record of peace out, woman, like I'm out of here, but there was some grounds to it, right? And so our, our stance is not a hard-pressed you can never have been divorced. In fact, we have elders on our board who have had to go through that. And so that is a challenge that we face. But the reason I say that is because they don't quote Hebrews. They quote, or they don't quote Exodus, they quote Deuteronomy. And they quote Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1, where it says, Suppose a man marries a woman, but she does not please him. This is so bad. When you read it, having discovered something wrong with her, it's like when you go to appraise a house, right? You're going to buy a house, <laughs> and you're like, well, the air conditioning unit is just a little off. I'm backing out of this deal. You know, like, or like, there's one nail pop. Like, no way, I'm out of the house. And like, <laughs> I'm sorry, but I, I get there's something wrong with her. Of course there's something wrong with her. There's something wrong with you, too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he writes a document of divorce, hands it to her, and sends her away from his house. Like, this is just, <laughs> why did we have to preach this? Um, <laughs> they quoted Deuteronomy but they leave out all these other teachings. They're just like, yeah, in Deuteronomy, it says basically you're not happy with her. She's a little off kilter. Peace out. But they want to focus on that, their human tradition, their and they're purposely misusing this text in the context. They're trying to prove something they want to prove. They're trying to trip Jesus up in this. They want to justify their own way of thinking and teaching. And Jesus had called them out on this earlier in Mark. It was in Mark chapter 7 that Jesus says, for you ignore God's law and substitute your own tradition. In other words, look, like you've been ignoring what God teaches and you just do what you want to do anyways. And he went on a whole list of how they did it. And so for us as believers, and when we're in relationships with other people, I think this is very important. It's important that we don't misquote Scripture. I could sit here and say, I have never been divorced. And so I could try to quote how excellent I am compared to someone who has been divorced. I've seen this happen with Christians. But what did Jesus just say in chapter 9? If you want to be the greatest, you have to become the least. Amen. And so it's not to come at people and try to make them feel horrible about their situation as if we got it right. Because guess what? The minute I point 
that speck out in your eye, there's a giant plank in my eye that I got to discover. And when we look at scripture, we have to be careful to not misquote it or misunderstand it to try to give ourselves a sense of power that we really don't have, but we want to know what God has for us. And so while we're careful to not misquote scripture, it's important that we don't avoid it either. Often we fall into the trap of reading the Bible from a bunch of do's and don'ts. But Jesus' heart and how he responds is going to help us see how Scripture can be used for teaching, rebuking, and guiding. And so he responds in verse 5. But Jesus responded. He wrote this commandment only as a concession to your hard heart. In other words, the reason that Moses wrote that is because of you. He wrote it because your heart has not been walking in the ways of God. He wrote that because guess what? You're full of pride and thinking you're so great. He wrote that because you guys are wanting divorce. He wrote that because of your life, not because it was a command from God. It was a concession See, a command is do this or don't do that. It's a black and white thing. Go and sin no more type of thing, right? Concession is because of blank. Now you have to handle this blank way. We do this with parenting all the time, right? Well, because you didn't wear your shirt yesterday and it was sunny, I have to deal with putting aloe on your back in the giant sunburn. Yeah, I failed as a father yesterday. My kids have horrible sunburn. Confession. But I don't want the aloe. No, because you made this choice, you get this choice, right? There's always a concession that has to be made. Concessions are made when the original plan breaks down. Think about in companies. This happens all the time. The original engine, the original part, the original way it was meant to be, it breaks down, and then they have to make concessions of how to make it right. That is what happens in concessions. And here we have Jesus saying, look, this wasn't a command. This was actually a concession. It was because of your situation that this came to be. Because here's the main point that Jesus is going to drive home. Divorce was not God's design for marriage, period. Divorce was not the plan. It was not what the plan was in the garden. It was not his original design. It says in verses 5 to 9, but Jesus responded, he wrote this commandment only as a concession to your hard hearts. And then he goes on to quote, guess what? Genesis. He goes all the way back to the garden. He goes all the way back to before the serpent causes them to eat of the fruit. He goes all the way back to his intended design. Jesus doesn't stick with Moses. He goes to Adam and Eve. And he goes back to that design. Because he says, God made them male and female from the beginning of creation. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. We say this at weddings all the time. And the two are united into one. Since they are no longer two but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. And we all sit at the altar and we all say, this is so beautiful. And then we go about our lives and we realize that's a lot harder to live out than it says. But Jesus goes back, this is how God had intended it from the beginning. I often get asked, why would a good God allow all of these bad things to happen? And simply put, it's because he wanted to give you choice in the matter. And because he didn't want to make you a robot and he wanted to give you choice, he did that from the very beginning. But just because he gave you choice, and we often choose selfishness versus God's way, doesn't mean that God is bad. In fact, because of his goodness, he gave us that. And his design was not for us to have broken relationships, but to have healthy ones that actually didn't even last only a lifetime, but an eternity. But the fact is, we welcomed death into it. We welcomed separation into it. We welcomed all of that into it in the garden. And Jesus is saying, look, the original design was not for what we have today. The original design was much more beautiful than you could ever imagine. It was for man and woman to be 
together. In verse 24, he makes it really clear that God's intentional design was for a man to leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, where the two would become one. The Pharisees, they wanted to talk about divorce, but Jesus, he wanted to talk about God's design for marriage. In church, can I encourage us with something? Everyone wants us to talk about the negative issues of the world. How about we talk about the positive issues of God? People often ask me, how do you handle all the sexuality issues going on, all the things that are happening in our society? And while I use scripture for it, I want to help people understand that God's way is the best way. And you know what we can do as a church? We can show healthy marriages to a world. We can show healthy relationships to a world. We can show what it looks like to be healthy to a world. And then they're going to want that. But if we show unhealth, are they going to want it? Because we're no different. And so God wants us to go back to those original intentions. And that's why he said in verse 18, it's not good for man to be alone I will make a helper just right for him. There's this beautiful picture where I can tell you I would be lost without my wife. Legitimately lost. Like I could be somewhere lost, like opposite, gone. (laughs) And some of you are sitting here and you're like, yeah, but Pastor Robert, that spouse is so far off in my life. Like I don't even know where they exist. A couple things. One, the scriptures are really clear that actually a single life is a beautiful life. We see that in Jesus. We see that in Paul. We see that in people who have, and so often as a church, we idolize marriage as if that is the pinnacle. Have this beautiful marriage house, have a white picket fence, have all these things. That is not the American marriage that we dreamed of in the 60s, 70s, those videos, is not what God had necessarily intended for us. Every one of us has a story. Every one of us comes from a different background. And God is going to use your story in a unique way. So for some of us, it has been, you know what, my whole life has been single. I've seen people saying, when am I ever going to get a spouse? And then out of nowhere, God sends Miss Beautiful or Mr. Beautiful, right? And then they're like, holy cow, I'm getting married. I'm like, you're getting married? Like, when's this happening? I've seen God do amazing things, but here's the point. When you are in a marriage, it's about complimenting one another. It's about being there for one another. Have you ever heard the saying, opposites attract? And then you come to my office arguing about why your opposites get you in fights. But they attract one another because you bring something that the other person doesn't have, and that's a beautiful thing. If you ask anyone who's been separated from a lifelong spouse, they'll know that emptiness that is there. Because that spouse was that person. The other thing to note is that God designed man and woman for one another. Jesus makes it very clear in Mark 10, verse 6, where he says, God made them male and female. God did not make them how they want to be or what they want to press. I didn't get to choose what I wanted in my mom's womb. That doesn't happen. God chose his plan for you. He chose his way for you. He made them male and female. And as Christians, we have to be bold enough to say that is truth. Point blank. There's nothing more to add to it. You can't change your chromosomes. Your chromosomes are your chromosomes that God gave you. And I've seen people born of all different situations. We have eunuchs in the Bible and we have eunuchs today, but it's how do you choose to live your life that way? Do you live it to glorify God or do you live it to glorify self? God made you a specific way for a specific purpose and it's so beautiful. And that's why he made you that way. Male and female, he created them. This is not out of spite, but this is out of love. Marriage between one male and one female is God's design. And that's why a man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife and the two become one. Because the marriage is about two separate individuals becoming one unit. Not for one to dominate Not for families to complicate things, but for two individuals 
to come together to benefit one another. And God's design is for these couples to stay together for life. Because in verse 9, Jesus says, let no one split apart what God has joined together. Jesus doesn't get into all the nuances of the effects of sin and of the world in relationships. He doesn't address unfaithfulness, abandonment, or abuse. These are all ramifications that come out of Genesis chapter 2. And I will say I am so sorry for anyone who's had to experience those things. That was not God's design. It was not his design for you to feel abandoned, misused, mistreated, or abused. And while these are topics that lead to much discussion for grounds for the divorce, it's important for you to know that if you are in an abusive relationship, have been abandoned by your spouse, you shouldn't just take this to just go a black and white thing and I got to go back for another punch on the other cheek or I got to go through another thing or another blow. But this is something to work through and be honest about and to know that it is a struggle. And for God to really come alongside you and to, to help you to find the healthy, full life that he has intended. But it is important also for us to note that God has desired for us to be honored, him to be honored in all marriages. And this means working through the crap that no one talks about. You know you can do more to honor God through working through your junk of your marriage than you can through saying everything's good, everything's perfect, everything's right. That doesn't honor God as much as saying, you know what, my life sucks. My spouse and I, we're really having a hard time. We're really struggling through this. And when you're honest about your struggle, guess what? Your church and your family, those who you feel safe with, right? They're not going to gossip. They're not going to slander. They're not going to cause division. But they can come alongside you. And guess what? You can see God do a beautiful work. That when you look back, you're going to say, wow, I'm so glad I went through that dark point. Because God was able to redeem it. While the Bible no longer, never condones divorce, it doesn't say it's right, it does recognize the reality of it. It was in Isaiah that it said, this is what the Lord says, was your mother sent away because I divorced her? Did I sell you as slaves to my creditors? No, you were sold because of your sins and your mother too. It's just kind of recognizing the fact that, yeah, that was a reality. That's something that, yeah, you face. And as Jesus would never divorce his bride, a spouse should never divorce his or her mate. That's the intention of God. Jesus doesn't go back on his covenant. He's coming for us. He's returning for us. He would go to the cross like he said he would. He rose from the grave like he said he would. He's going to come return for his church, his bride, like he said he would. He doesn't go back on his word. So church, we can't be a people that go back on our word. Because the world wants us to think that one day we're going to find the perfect someone and then we're going to have the perfect life together and we fantasize about this perfect life and what it's supposed to look like. And if you talk to anyone who's been married for any decent amount of time, you will know that the time you know your spouse least is on your wedding day. That is when you know the least about them. Silly example? I was really good at showing Jessica that she was my priority and sports were not. And then we got married and I had to watch all the games again. She's like, when did you like sports? I told you I liked them. Small little thing. But so often you think you know your spouse when you get married, but the reality is you have so much to learn on your journey in marriage. And that's why I believe that the more a couple glorifies God in their marriage and in their relationship, the more they see God do incredibly more. I am not the same person I was almost 10 years ago when I married Jessica. And I can guarantee she's not the same person she was when she married me. But I can tell you I'm a heck of a better man because of her. And I hope she's a better woman because of me. But more importantly, because of our love for Jesus and our wanting to live for him and, and, and go his way and go his direction and follow his will and his guidance. And that means working through a lot of crappy situations, but honoring God through all of it. Because our marriages, my last point, are a reflection of Jesus' relationship with his church. Ephesians chapter 5 is a beautiful passage about the husband sacrificing for his wife and the wife understanding 
submitting for her husband. Not like a submit like this, but a beautiful relationship as Christ in the church. Because here's the thing. The disciples are wrestling through this. And when they're alone in verse 10 to 12, they brought up the subject again and he told them, whoever divorces his wife and marries someone else commits adultery against her. And if a woman divorces her husband and marries someone else, she commits adultery. It's in this passage that Jesus is expanding on what you would find in Matthew 19, 9, where he's looking at certain instances of unfaithfulness. It's in 19.9, it says, And I tell you this, whoever divorces his wife and marries someone else commits adultery unless his wife has been unfaithful. There's a key point there that is left in Matthew that's not in Mark. But when I look at these passages, there's one thing that keeps coming to mind. Sin seeks to destroy marriages, but God seeks to sustain them. Sin wants to get in the way of your marriage, your covenant, and your relationship. It wants to destroy it. But God's desire is for your relationship to grow stronger through the ups and through the downs. God's desire is for troubled marriages to have reconciliation in them. And so I'll leave you with these five statements that we can take away from Jesus. Number one, marriage is a gift. It is a beautiful gift. Two, God's design for marriage is a heterosexual and unique compared to other relationships. Your marriage is not like your best friend. They are different. Your marriage is your marriage. There is a difference between them. Three, God's design from the beginning was for marriages to last forever. Unfortunately, death came into the world, and it's very clear that marriage is until death do us part. Four, Jesus recognizes that because of the imperfection of this world, divorce will happen. That is a reality. And I'm sorry, many of you have had to struggle through that. And I don't make light of that. I know it's a very serious, ongoing, everyday battle. And five, to divorce without biblical cause and remarry another is to commit adultery. It's important to not see marriage like dating. This is all too often the case. We're going to get married at, you know, the pastor who's going to marry us or the judge or whoever. We're just going to get married because we think we should get married. We don't take it very seriously. And then guess what happens? We weren't prepared for the marriage because marriage is not an up and to the right. It is a giant roller coaster. But it is a fun ride. It's a giant roller coaster. And so we have to be careful to make sure that we stay biblical in that. And as a church, we need to emphasize and value the dignity of marriage while eliminating the shame and stigma of divorce. Church, I pray that we aren't a church that shames or stigmatizes people because of their story, their past, or their background. But that we are a church that fights for what God has intended for marriage. And that we are a church focused on Him and our relationships. Will you pray with me?